All right, good morning, everybody. Um, hope you had a good Thanksgiving and got to watch some uh, basketball yesterday. Start on a happy note. UConn uh, did us proud. You saw both the men and the women, uh, you know, won the Phil Knight championships. We're going to get some new uh, rankings out, I think, uh, later today, which will show uh, Connecticut is a powerhouse. I like... Um, I like basketball because you control your own destiny with a, a great coach and a great team and great recruiting. Uh, energy is a little more complicated. Uh, we don't have total control over our destiny, but we do what we can to make life a little easier for folks. A lot of uh, what you get in terms of uh, pricing is determined in places like Riyadh and uh, Moscow. But that said, um, we've got a special session today that I believe is going to make uh, a real difference in um, mitigating um, the high cost of uh, energy um, and making life a little bit easier for our ratepayers here in the state of Connecticut. Uh, I'll start with gasoline. Um, we have the lowest uh, gas prices in the Northeast, which is uh, a good thing, but still a lot more uh, than they were a couple of years ago, and I know people are feeling that pain. Uh, we've reached a good agreement, I believe, with um, the legislature where we're going to continue the um, 25 cent gas tax uh, reduction until January 1. And then rather than have a cliff, it will slowly go down at um, the tax cut at five cents until it um, will be back to normal operating procedure. Uh, I think it's May 1st. Uh, alongside of that, uh, we're going to continue um, free bus service. Uh, I think it's made an enormous difference, made life a little bit more livable for people, especially uh, given the high price of gasoline. We've seen some uptick in the number of people using our buses, which I think is a very good thing. Um, but Johnny has told me that the feds won't allow us to continue this past uh, for more than one year, which, again, I think is May 1st. So at least we've got that continued uh, through this winter because it could be a cold winter. You know, that's gasoline. Um, let me talk now more broadly about energy and electric prices and home heating. Uh, working uh, very closely with the legislative leaders, um, uh, a couple of things. One, one of the things we did in anticipation or planning in terms of electric usage and getting control over our own destiny was making the deal with Millstone going back about three years. Uh, that Millstone deal, um, carbon-free nuclear power, um, is uh, continuing to pay dividends. Uh, it's uh, locked in at a uh, 4.99 cents a kilowatt hour. I told Ryan Dreswitz, not one more, not one dime more than five cents. So he honored that, and um, and that is paying us um, uh, dividends. We've got uh, well over 90 million dollars of uh, credits that have accrued. What that means is we're going to uh, be able to front load that. And that uh, means that by front-loading what we're getting off of the, um, the millstone credit is going to save us about 10% um, on your energy bill, something like uh, 8 or $9 a month. And that's on top of the other millstone and other renewable credits. We're also making good money on solar and other uh, investments we've made, given the high price of natural gas. And so that's on top of a uh, 8 or $9 credit as well. I think that um, is impactful. Uh, at least uh, through this winter. And um, I think you'll probably see that continue on to some degree, given the high price of natural gas. You know, over and above that, um, working with um, the legislature, we've got an additional $30 million for LIHEAP, the Low Income uh, Energy Assistance Program. Right now, we still have good capacity in LIHEAP. Um, you know, uh, demand is up a little bit, no question about it, given what's uh, going on. But uh, LIHEAP is going to be a way that we can provide significant savings to um, Connecticut ratepayers earning up to about $75,000 a year. And uh, that is available now. Uh, my recommendation is to, um, you know, think about applying for the LIHEAP um, support, um, assuming that you are eligible. Uh, Deirdre will give you the details on, on how we do that. Over and above, uh, the LIHEAP and the additional money we, we have in there will take us up to about, I think it's $130 million. Again, we have a lot of additional capacity there, and we'll see what the feds want to do if they want to add to it as well. 
Uh, over and above that, we have um, Operation Fuel. Operation Fuel is a not-for-profit program. It's been in place for a while. It was funded to the tune of about a four and a half million dollars. Uh, Operation Fuel means uh, you're not capped at seventy-five million, but you're capped at seventy-five thousand dollars a year. But you're capped at uh, ninety-five, and we're going to try and get that raised up to one hundred percent of the median, which would be about one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year in income. So if you have one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year in income, you're worried about uh, the high price of um, uh, electricity and um, fuel, and they want to do something else that we can to support. That's where we're going to be able to uh, provide that with the operation um, fuel. That's four and a half million dollars. Um, I've spent uh, some of uh, the Thanksgiving weekend talking to um, uh, Eversource and UI. I've said, look, uh, the taxpayers and the ratepayers are, are putting up a lot given uh, the incredibly complicated times in which we live what that means coming into a cold winter, what that means in terms of home heating, what that means in terms of gasoline, what that means in terms of electricity, I'd like you to come forward as well. And um, you can tell me, and I get it, uh, all you're doing is passing along generation prices. You have nothing to do with them. It's all Putin's fault. Whatever it is, I think it's really important that you step up as a good faith effort for the ratepayers as well. And, um, and, and don't roll that in the rate base and we pay later, but um, do that out of the shareholders and provide a little extra support for uh, the folks here in Connecticut. We're partners in this. And uh, I'm really pleased to say that um, Joe Nolan from Eversource uh, has stepped up. They are going to uh, contribute $10 million, $10 million to um, uh, Operation um, Fuel. And what that means in terms of being able to uh, more than double the amount of money we have there. We're still in discussions with the UI. They're going to do a minimum of $3 million. So I think you're going to see we're tripling or almost quadrupling what we're able to provide for Operation Fuel. I think uh, those are ways that we can provide um, almost immediate support for people. Apply for that. Operation Fuel opens up again. I think it's in a few weeks. And uh, take advantage of that. If you're eligible for... Um, LIHEAP, you know, they're going to send you there first because uh, we've got a lot more resources there. If maybe your income level is above the LIHEAP number, above that 75,000, operation fuel is something you should take advantage of. Uh, finally, um, we uh, provided additional resources for energy efficiency. This is going back, I think, uh, last summer. Uh, it's something I still recommend. I've said this to you a number of times, and I'll say it again. Energy efficiency, if you're in one of those homes, maybe built in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, probably not as uh, energy efficient as it could be, not too late. Apply now. We've got resources in that program. We'll do an energy audit for you. You know, within uh, six, nine weeks, we'll be able to get out there and provide some relief for you. And that can save you another $20, $50, $60, dollars, depending on how much work uh, ends up being done on your house in terms of energy efficiency. There's nothing better than um, a kilowatt hour that you don't need, you don't have to pay for, and does not generate any greenhouse. I think those are some of the priorities we've got, a ways that we can make a real difference in people's lives, starting almost immediately. And uh, we've got some folks here that can provide a lot of the detail and context to this, starting with our amazing commissioner of DEEP, Katie Dykes. Thank you, Governor. Um, we were, I, I just want to applaud and appreciate the governor really pulling everybody together um, to come up with this package of energy assistance commitments that uh, we can put in place uh, immediately. Uh, I think the key is, uh, you know, as we work through who's, you know, who's to blame, uh, as you mentioned, Governor, these are geopolitical events, you know, beyond our borders that are driving fossil fuel prices up. Um, but the key here is who's in a position to help. And I, I think you see uh, uh, here in the room um, those who worked over the holiday, uh, over the holiday weekend to put together a proposal. Um, it's not a uh, the the uh, total solution, but these are near-term dollars that we can put in place to help people who are really struggling um, with these high energy costs. Adding to you know, I, I think uh, it was about two decades ago that Connecticut established our renewable portfolio standard um, and our energy efficiency programs. And part of the reason was to solve, you know, things like climate change, but also to provide a hedge against the volatility of this fossil fuel roller coaster. We've always been an importer 
of fossil fuels into New England. And energy independence is part of those policies. And so it's really gratifying to see that the investments that DEEP has been overseeing, the procurements we've been doing for solar, uh, for wind, for uh, nuclear over the years are now generating revenues for customers. About $200 million this year. Customers already saw their bill go down by 8 to $10 effective September 1 from the earnings on those contracts. And now, uh, because those contracts continue uh, to perform strongly, we have an additional $90 plus million that will be returned to customers if PIRA approves the request that's being filed uh, as we speak. Um, those, th that would be an additional uh, approximately $10 a month bill reduction um, that will go into effect January 1. Also, as part of that request to PIRA that's being submitted today, we're asking PIRA to um, uh, hold a hearing and, uh, and consider an expedited process to accelerate the implementation of the low-income discount rate that was put in place uh, in response to the Take Back the Grid Act. Um, under the PIRA decision uh, issued recently, that low-income discount rate will uh, go into effect in January 2024. We want to see what we can do to constructively provide that, um, that credit or rebate for low-income customers as soon as possible. And so uh, I appreciate joining with the utilities and the Consumer Council um, to uh, roll up our sleeves uh, in the PIRA hearing room and see if there's a way that we can make that happen. Um, the Governor uh, mentioned uh, the, uh, the shareholder contributions, and I do appreciate um, how our, our regulated utilities are, are stepping up um, to help. And uh, in addition, the Energize CT uh, program, um, the, the Governor directed $3.5 million from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative uh, program uh, that earlier this summer to make sure that the efficiency programs would be there for customers who want it at this time. And we are seeing a 30 percent increase in residential uh, customer demand for energy efficiency services. This is the moment that we built these programs for. So, Governor, thank you for protecting those funds, adding additional funds. EnergizeCT.com is the place you can go to find out about that program. In addition, for folks who are uh, looking at their standard service rate, uh, the increase that's going to affect in January, um, EnergizeCT.com also has the supplier rate board. As a result of deregulation, you do have the ability to shop for alternate uh, supplier rates. It's not for everyone. It's important to be uh, an informed consumer if you do want to sign up uh, with a rate with an alternate supplier, um, but you can uh, learn more about how to shop in that market on EnergizeCT.com. Uh, so, um, and finally, I'll say uh, we're talking a lot about the electric grid today, um, but the heating oil uh, sector is also something that we're closely monitoring. Um, many, we have about 40 percent of uh, uh, residents are heating with heating oil, and they, uh, we're seeing uh, price spikes for heating oil um, this year across the region, again, driven by these geopolitical events. So the LIHEAP funding, um, th that heating assistance that Commissioner, Gilman, or, sorry, Commissioner Gifford will talk about is, uh, is there for, for you, whether you're heating with heating oil or electricity or any fuel. Um, but but uh, that's, that's another important thing that we have available. We're encouraging folks to closely monitor your, uh, your um, uh, heating oil tank and how much fuel oil you have on hand um, as the supplies are really tight uh, in New England uh, at this time. So please, you know, make sure everyone is talking to your heating oil dealer if you heat with heating oil and uh, sign up for energy assistance if you qualify. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I'll introduce our Consumer Council, Claire Coleman. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Governor. Um, all of the details have been laid out for you. I will just say that, you know, since the supply rates uh, were filed with PIRA on the 17th, um, many of us in this room, including the governor, the commissioner, the utilities, uh, other stakeholders have been working round the clock to figure out how do we get help to customers the fastest. Um, and the, the proposal that is before the legislature today to increase LIHEAP and the proposal that we worked on through Thanksgiving through the weekend um, with different pieces of the package that, um, that the commissioner walked through are all near-term steps to design to ensure that we have money flowing by the time January 1st supply rate increases start. Uh, they are important contributions uh, and important regulatory filings that we will be submitting over the course of uh, the next 24 hours to seek PIRA's approval to ensure that there will be both um, you know, bill credits as a result of the 
the PPAs, there will be a low income discount rate uh, that is uh, an interim measure from the final low income discount rate that um, Pura has recently approved um, that our office has been part of advocating for. And, and the goal is to get customers uh, the ability to pay an affordable rate. Because we know that when a customer can pay something that is manageable within their budget, they're more likely to pay their utility bill. If they can also afford their heat and their, and their grocery bill, they will pay their utility bill. If it's too exorbitant and it's just not realistic for their budget, they won't pay that bill. So by providing an affordable rate, uh, we're ensuring, helping to ensure that customers will pay um, with greater regularity. And that helps all rate payers uh, because those bills that aren't paid end up being, um, being paid for by the full rate payer community. So that is a, a really important part of this package is, is ensuring that during this high heating uh, and high electricity season in the winter, we have an interim low income discount rate in place. Um, the other pieces of, of the package um, that are being proposed, um, you know, I spent the weekend uh, talking back and forth multiple times with uh, Frank Reynolds, the president of UI, about how we can get some company um, contributions in into this pot because, as the governor said, you know, it's not, it, it's just not fair that ratepayers absorb all of the costs of helping out other other ratepayers. The companies, you know, we've talked about <laughs> about um, blame, and, and I, I am, you know, one to clarify that the supply prices that we are seeing are not something that the utilities profit from. Um, the companies have done their best to procure at the lowest pro uh, possible price that um, we could have achieved during this market volatility. Um, and we're the subject of a global market, um, a, you know, a global energy crisis. Uh, and it's hitting us here in Connecticut, in addition to across New England. These high supply prices we've, uh, we're seeing are not unique to Connecticut. Our neighboring states uh, are, are facing the same challenges. So not only are we working um, you know, with our local partners, but we're also working regionally. Um, but to bring, bring it back to the contributions, I think regardless of, of, of those supply issues and the cause and effect, we all recognize um, that our utilities here in Connecticut are also doing very well uh, as companies. And it's, um, it's with that broader lens of recognizing when a company is profitable and works to serve Connecticut customers uh, to provide essential services, that they have a responsibility to come to the table um, and to help be a part of that solution. Now, um, I have stressed throughout um, these discussions this weekend that I view this, this package as a first step. These are, you know, initial proposals designed to get us to a point where by July, or, I'm sorry, by January 1st, customers have help, there's money flowing. But these conversations cannot end here because we have a lot of a, a lot of long-term problems uh, to work out to ensure that bills are affordable in the long term, that we're not back here um, again next winter with these high supply prices, um, and that we're looking, evaluating the markets and our utility regulatory structure in a holistic way. So I appreciate all of the work um, to get to where we are today, and I am looking forward to continuing to work um, across the aisle with all of our private sector partners, not just the utilities, but the suppliers, uh, as well as all of our government leaders uh, to ensure that we can help weather this energy crisis um, with the least harm to customers. Can you Thank answer you. how accessible this money is? Say you're paying your bills and all of a sudden you realize you can't pay. We wait one more second. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I'm sorry. Commissioner Gifford is going to talk through LIHEAP and then we can, we can walk through that. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Deidre Gifford, Connecticut Department of Social Services. Um, thank you, Commissioner Dykes. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Governor, 
for bringing us together to talk about how we can provide even more energy assistance to the residents of Connecticut. Um, as you've heard, today the governor is going to ask the legislature to approve an additional $30 million for the Connecticut Energy Assistance Program, also known as LIHEAP. This will uh, increase the 2023 budget for LIHEAP by almost 30%. This $30 million will give DSS the flexibility to adjust the benefits as they are most needed as we go through this winter season. So far, our LIHEAP budget, which is a federally funded program, is at just over $98 million in federal funds. Uh, but because of the volatility in energy prices that you've been hearing about, and also because of improvements that DSS has been making in partnership with our community action agencies in the application process, um, we are anticipating um, higher enrollment in the program this year. And we think that that $98 million in federal funds will be needed just to fund the program that's already been approved by the legislature. Applications, as you heard the governor mention, are up 17% over uh, this time last year. And we also anticipate that people who enroll in the program will use more of the benefits that they than they have in the past. Last year, we had 92,000 households enrolled in uh, LIHEAP, which was the highest in eight years. And we anticipate even more households being enrolled this year. So what will this additional $30 million mean for the residents of Connecticut? Um, first of all, uh, as you heard the governor mention, households in Connecticut are eligible for LIHEAP if they earn less than 60% of the state median income. That's about $76,000 for a family of four. In LIHEAP, you can get help not only with home heating oil, but you can also get help paying your utility bills uh, if you heat with uh, gas or electricity. The benefits differ depending on household size, household composition, and income level. But the maximum benefit can be close to $2,000 uh, for families that heat with deliverable fuel and have vulnerable mem members living in the household. And even renters whose utility costs or whose heating costs are included in their rent are eligible for a small one-time benefit. Some of this $30 million is likely uh, to be used to uh, support what we call a, a crisis benefit. That is, uh, a family that's exhausted their, uh, their base benefits and has run out of deliverable fuel. Um, they can apply for additional crisis benefits, um, as many as three. Um, vulnerable households are those with someone over the age of 60, young children, or a disabled household member. Funding can also be used, though, for uh, middle-income families, as I mentioned, up to $75,000 in annual income to offset the costs of their utilities um, and for one-time home, home heating fuel deliveries. So with this additional $30 million, DSS will be able to ensure that mo more households receive the extra assistance that they might need through this winter. Uh, I'm grateful not only for the partnership of uh, the Consumer Council and uh, DEEP, the Governor's Office, and the utilities, but also for our community action agencies uh, all across the state who have been busy uh, not only implementing our new online application, but making continued improvements to the application process. Um, we've added an automatic eligibility check for SNAP and cash, which means that people don't need to provide as much verification to demonstrate that they're eligible. Um, and they have uh, about 160 intake sites all around the state. So how can you apply? Uh, applications are open for the LIHEAP program. Uh, to apply for benefits, you can go to ct.gov slash heating help. And there are other, uh, there's other information on that website in addition to the LIHEAP, the um, Home uh, Efficiency Program, and other programs you can also find out about. You can always call 211 um, or go to the 211 website. 
Um, you can visit a community action agency if you're not sure where your community action, action agency is. The list is at ct.gov slash heating help. Or you can visit one of the 160 intake sites around the state. So uh, that is a summary of how uh, LIHEAP uh, is going to benefit from the additional $30 million. We have a big group, and obviously there are going to be a fair amount of questions here. Sue, you'll go first. We'll stay on topic. If there is time, we'll do off topics afterwards. Thank you, and I apologize for jumping the gun. I just wanted to know how accessible the money is and how quickly families can get it. So if you find yourself in a situation maybe you didn't think at the onset, and now all of a sudden, you know, we're having a bad winter, you know, the process and how quickly someone can get that assistance. And is it up to $2,000? Is that what I'll start and then pass it to people who really know what they're talking about. Um, the good news is uh, we have additional resources in LIHEAP right now. Uh, we have additional resources in Energy Efficiency Fund right now. What we're doing, truing these up in anticipation of what could come forward in the future. Want to add to that? Uh, just from the LIHEAP perspective, so um, uh, the first uh, fuel deliveries that were eligible for LIHEAP were on November 1st. So uh, families can already be benefiting from the, the LIHEAP program. We tend to make the utility payments a little bit later into the season, but you can, you can and should go online now and apply for the LIHEAP program even if uh, you have utility supply heat. So the answer to your question is, if you're eligible for the LIHEAP program, the benefits are available now. And did you say it's up to $2,000? People can it, uh, a household, a low-income household that receives deliverable fuel can be eligible for as much as uh, it's about nineteen hundred dollars <coughs> this season. Thank you. What would you say to folks? What we trying to do with the other <coughs> portions of the the funds, the EverSource contribution, for example, and um, the contribution that um, we will seek uh, approval from Pura for for both. Um, the UI contribution, which is connected to an, another uh, Pura settlement, as well as the two pieces of the millstone credit, um, th th they'll be available in different tranches. The Eversource contribution uh, and the UI contributions we've been discussing, plussing up Operation Fuels budget, uh, with the desire to, to really get at those customers who are on the margins who might not qualify for LIHEAP uh, might be just above that 60% SMI, but given the supply prices, given food prices, given all the other inflationary pressures, they're gonna have a hard time paying all of their bills this summer. And we wanna make sure those lower middle income people who, uh, who are struggling uh, have funds that are accessible to them. And we'll seek um, PIRA's approval to get some of these funds in place as soon as possible. And of course, uh, seek for the Eversource contribution to get into customers' hands uh, as quickly as possible. The program that was authorized in 2020 that you hope will be in place no later than 2024, <coughs> is that additional assistance or is that something that is meant to uh, normalize or, or, or have this basically go on autopilot? If people are on record with DSS for various programs that their electric bill would somehow be automatically lowered. I mean, can you just help us understand that what that Are really you talking about the low income yeah. discount rate? Yes. You have been wrong. Sure. So the low income discount rate, a, a permanent program was approved by Pura this summer in August. This was after the legislature passed uh, authorization of developing a low income discount rate in the Take Back Your Good Act. There was a lot of hearings and development of a record to determine what, what the best balance there was. That, that um, formal program is going to take uh, the utilities almost a year to, to implement because of, of various billing, billing changes. So what we're trying to do here is to put a stopgap measure in place and say while the official low income discount rate is being implemented by the utilities, let's get a credit to the same low income customers. It's going to be um, simpler criteria, probably based on the hardship designation that many customers face. And this is subject to Pura approval, um, so that the details will still be worked out through that regulatory process. That if you qualify at some point in the future, your bill actually, yes. that'll be reflected in a monthly bill. So Correct. It, okay, so you won't have to apply That's for any, okay. That is a permanent program. Okay. 
the interim program will be a bill credit, but eventually we'll have a reduced low income rate um, based on whether you're 60% SMI or above 150% of the federal poverty guidelines. There's a tiered program. But this is just a much simpler um, bill credit um, that will be put in place until that low income discount rate is able to be implemented. And then the millstone portion? So those earnings actually, uh, your bill will just automatically be lower. Um, that started in September. Your bill is lower, it zeroed out other charges, so it's lower by about eight bucks a month for every residential customer. And if PIRA approves the return of those additional earnings, then the, these contracts effective January 1, we'd expect that to be an additional roughly $10 a month that your bill will just be lower. And by the way, that's both for residential and commercial customers. What are you expecting decisions by PIRA? Well, the filing just went in this morning, so um, I, 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 we're hopeful that PIRA will be able to expedite. Like but a we, couple days, a couple weeks? I can't speak for them, but I know, uh, you know PIRA's been very focused on energy affordability as well, so we hope that this, as a joint proposal, will be something that can move forward quickly. This may be a question for the Consumer Council, but last week the Senate Democrats, they called for PURA to work with their counterparts in Massachusetts and New Hampshire to have some kind of hearing on the Eversource rate increase. Is that something that will actually do anything? Do you think like having states join together will have any kind of influence on the utility? Sure. I think um, evaluating what's happening across the region and what could be best practices is always helpful. I am in uh, close contact with my counterpoints in Massachusetts and New Hampshire um, to talk about their procurement <coughs> processes, how they're you know similar and different to ours. Uh, having a hearing to to kind of flesh out um, you know the pros and cons of different models you know is is always helpful, uh, and I think will be of value. You know, in general, our you know Connecticut pr procurement process um, it, uh, it went through a substantial changes from 2012 through 2018 um, to get to a point where we have um, a, a multi-phase ladder ladder uh, approach with laddering, um, which I think other states um, agree is a is a best practice. Um, and you know, look forward to that hearing as an opportunity to to learn more. Hold for one second on cluster discovery of the mic. explanation as to why there is credit produced by the long-term savings during the most growing contract. Sure. So <clears throat> essentially when we uh, have been invested, you know, as we've been pursuing uh, increases to the amount of renewable energy that's supplying uh, customers in Connecticut, New England, as well as the contract that we struck with Millstone, and also another contract we did with Seabrook, which is another nuclear facility, those contracts are structured as 20-year uh, fixed price power purchase agreements. So they function sort of as hedges in a sense. Um, that's a fixed price, 20 years. And those prices, uh, when, when, you know, uh, when you compare it to what the, the average, the, the market, the wholesale market price is in the New England region, um, the, those wholesale market prices are, are pretty much di di dictated by the price of natural gas because the ice in New England market has procured a whole bunch of natural gas power plants. So as we see, fossil fuel prices are exposed to geopolitical events. They're traded on the world market. With the, the cutoff of uh, Russian energy supplies to Europe, we're now in competition uh, with Europe for commodities like natural gas. And so those prices have been very volatile over the last uh, couple of, you know, over the last two to three years and uh, most recently, significant price spikes. So that means that um, when the utilities are managing those long-term contracts, they're essentially able to hedge uh, the, the differential. We, we, are, we are essentially earning anything above the contract price um, uh, that we have for those uh, renewables or the nuclear. Um, if the market price, the wholesale market price is higher than what the contract price is, that actually generates 
revenue, and that is 100% fully passed back um, to Connecticut customers. And, uh, and it's passed back through the non-bypassable charge on your distribution portion of your bill. I was going to ask the governor that question, but I thought <laughs> <laughs> she read my notes. <laughs> so, big big picture. Can, are, today, can you assure um, ratepayers, uh, home heating oil customers, that nobody's going to go cold or dark this winter? Yeah, the answer to that is yes. There's a no-cut-off strategy. We're providing all the additional subsidies we can right now, um, making people get through the, what's a really tough winter. But as, at the end of the day, um, you can't do everything by subsidy. We've got to figure out how we get control of our own um, you know, power future. And uh, Sue, she, before she ran out, you know, uh, we're working with the regional governors. Uh, I want to find out what we can do to bring down some of that um, hydropower from Quebec. You know, three states in a row have said, no, you can't bring transmission lines in. That makes our lives a lot more complicated. I want to work with our regional governors in terms of how we can build more reserve capacity for natural gas as well as home heating oil. We can't do it all by ourselves. These are some of the places we're changing. But you are talking about working within the current deregulated, when it least comes to generation. You are talking about working within the current market system, not trying to figure out how to put the toothpaste back in the tube on... Um, I think so, but, you know, I want to make sure we're not stuck in this situation in three years. I want to do everything we can to make sure we have options. I'll also say that, look, um, the federal government has provided an enormous amount of funding that they put on the table to help us accelerate investments in clean energy resources that can help us gain energy independence from fossil fuels. So, for example, just so we can have go, the Department of Energy put out a funding opportunity for transmission. Um, you know, the, the, uh, in addition to tax credits for offshore wind and other renewables, um, storage, and so on and so forth. So it's more affordable than ever for us to advance the investments that we need in resources that can provide a clean alternative to natural gas and finally hopefully get New England to a place that we're, we're no longer net export, uh, importers of fossil fuels and, and uh, re you know, reliant on these volatile markets. Um, but I think really important is that for folks who may need help this winter, you know, you need to request assistance. And so visiting Energy ICT, um, calling 211, visiting your cap, local CAP agency to sign up um, for heating assistance, find out if you qualify, or reaching out to Operation Fuel uh, starting January 1. Um, those are, you know, those resources are there for you, but we encourage people, if you're hearing this message and you're concerned about your ability to pay, um, take actions now to find out how to tap into some of those resources. What are the, the shut-off policies? Some of the utilities, they won't turn off, right, through for the winter months, is that right? This, by the way, this is the last question. Right now, hardship customers, those with at an <coughs> income eligibility level where they're designated hardship or a medical hardship customers cannot be shut off. It's the non-hardship residential customers that, that can be shut off at this time. And, um, and that's why we're seeking to focus on ensuring that those customers without that hardship designation have the extra funding support to ensure they can pay their bills and not be at risk. Thanks, everybody.